Let's waste no time. If you planned on sleeping tonight, forget it. Hit those lights, sit back, and enjoy these terrifying real-life tales. Now, before we begin, we'd like to say a special thank you to this video's sponsor, Raycon. Raycon's everyday earbuds are ideal for keeping you entertained throughout the day. Their noise isolation feature is incredible, and they are well known as a premium audio brand with amazing and affordable products like the everyday earbuds and everyday headphones. We love them for listening to podcasts on all things spooky and strange, as the sound quality is great, and the noise isolating feature helps you feel like you're really involved. You can get premium sound at a great price, and save even more while making your audio even better. Use our link buyraycon.com forward slash top fives to support the channel, and get 15% off site-wide. Now, please enjoy. The Disappearance of the Crew of the L-8 At around 6 a.m. on August 16, 1942, the U.S. Navy blimp L-8 set off from an airfield on Treasure Island in San Francisco on a routine coastal anti-submarine patrol. Its planned route involved passing over the Farallon Islands, Point Reyes and Monterey, before heading back towards Golden Gate Bridge. Inside the craft were two men, 27-year-old Lieutenant Ernest Wood Cody and his co-pilot, 34-year-old Ensign Charles Adams. Both were experienced pilots, with Ernest graduating from the Naval Academy in 1938 and Charles spending over a decade in the Navy. He had previously survived the crash and sinking of the USS Macon back in 1935. A third man, flight mechanic J. Riley Hill, had been due to join them but was removed as the airship was overweight. By all accounts, the blimp, inspected recently, was in excellent condition, having made almost 1,100 trips without incident. Furthermore, the weather conditions on the 16th were perfect. It was a clear morning, and the wind was light. At 7.38am, the men radioed to Treasure Island after they'd seen an oil slick four miles off the coast of the Farallon Islands. The last confirmed sighting of the blimp with its crew aboard was when several boat crews witnessed the airship lowering to within 30 feet of the ocean surface and circling the oil slick for closer inspection. It was later established that two flares were dropped to mark its location. The Treasure Island controllers lost contact with the L-8 at around 8.50 a.m. Just after 9 a.m., the blimp ascended and headed east, though it should have been going northwest towards Point Reyes. The L-8 was seen again at 11.15 a.m. when it appeared off the coast of Ocean Beach drifting towards the coastline at low elevation and sagging sharply in the middle. It floated slowly over the beach before catching on a cliff. It promptly broke loose, scraped across the roofs of houses and dislodged power lines, eventually crashing into the 400 block of Bellevue Avenue in Daly City, California. Emergency responders rushed to the scene to save the L-8's crew, but it was quickly discovered there was no one on board to save. Fishermen who tried to restrain the ship when it touched the beach earlier noted that it had been empty. As a result of the bizarre disappearance of the crew, the media dubbed the airship the Ghost Blimp, a name that has stuck with it to this day. The investigation into what had happened to the L-8 and its crew began shortly after the crash. The door to the Blimp's control car was open, but there were no signs of fire or other damage. It was also noted that the ship's radio was in working order missing one of the anti-submarine depth charges it usually carried. However, this was later located at a local golf course the ship had passed over before the crash. Parachutes were found to be adequately stored, and the ship's life raft remained. Though two life jackets were missing, it was standard practice for the crew to wear life jackets at all times. Witnesses who spoke with investigators gave mixed accounts. Most concluded that they'd seen no one on board the blimp, but one woman out riding her horse in the area claimed that she'd seen three men on board when she looked with her binoculars. Others reported seeing men parachuting from the ship before it went down. The Navy continued searching for the men for days, but no trace of them or their life jackets were ever found. Over the years, there have been numerous theories about what happened to Lieutenant Cody and Ensign Adams. Some suggested that it was an elaborate desertion plot, or that they'd been taken prisoner by the Japanese, or that the men had got into a fight and one had murdered the other before staging his disappearance. Other theories involved the men being captured by UFOs, being killed by a stowaway, 
or accidentally falling out of the blimp to their deaths. The mother of Lieutenant Cody even claimed that she'd seen her son in Phoenix a year after his disappearance, noting that his eyes looked peculiar, as though he was suffering from shock or mental illness. However, all of these theories remain unproven. The two men were declared dead a year after they went missing, and whatever happened to them on August 16th, 1942, remains a mystery. The Tragic Life of Rosemary Kennedy Rosemary Kennedy was born on September 13, 1918. She was the third child and first daughter of Joseph Kennedy Sr. and his wife Rose. Her birth had not been easy, though this information did not become public knowledge until more recent years. As a doctor was unavailable at the time of her birth, and the available nurse was reluctant to deliver the baby alone, the nurse told Rose to hold her legs together tightly in the hope of delaying the baby's birth. But when that failed, she began holding the baby's head and forcing it back into the birth canal for two excruciating hours. Eventually, Rosemary was born, but it was noted that she lost a lot of oxygen while she had been forced to stay in the birth canal. As she became a toddler, her parents noticed that she didn't seem to be developing in the same way as her peers or older siblings had. By all accounts, it seems that Rosemary had some intellectual disability, but the Kennedys were very secretive about her making it difficult to discern the exact nature of Rosemary's condition. Her mother reportedly told friends she was making significant progress and developing like the other children, but it was clear early on that she was different. Despite having tutors, she struggled to read and write, and she was very slow as a toddler learning how to crawl and walk. At 11, Rosemary was sent to stay at a Pennsylvania boarding school for children with intellectual disabilities. Four years later, she was sent to attend the Sacred Heart Convent in Elmhurst, Rhode Island, where she was taught separately from the other students. At this time, it was reported that she had the reading, writing, spelling and counting abilities of children between 9 and 10. Despite the secrecy surrounding Rosemary, she spent the 1930s attending dances, the opera, dress fittings and other regular activities of a young wealthy girl from an influential family. Her parents told some media outlets that she was studying to be a kindergarten teacher but at other times described her as having an interest in social welfare work. However, she was said to harbor a secret longing to go on the stage. Though her parents tried to ensure she was involved, taking her sailing and having boys ask her to dance at parties, things became significantly more difficult when Rosemary got older and her temper began to get the best of her. She was known to lash out and become violent when she was angry or frustrated, and she suffered rather extreme mood swings and seizures. Her sister recalled that in 1940, at age 22, after she returned from a trip to the UK, Rosemary had become increasingly irritable and difficult. This led to her being expelled from a summer camp in Massachusetts, and only managing a few months at a Philadelphia boarding school. She was subsequently sent to a convent school in Washington, DC, where she began sneaking out at night. The nuns worried she was seeing sexual partners and would catch an STD or fall pregnant, while her father, learning of this, worried that her behavior would bring shame and embarrassment to the family. In November 1941, when Rosemary was 23, her father scheduled a lobotomy for her without telling his wife. It was hoped that the surgery would calm her mood swings and lessen her violent outbursts. The doctor who carried out the surgery claimed that Rosemary had a form of depression. It seems that every patient he treated, he diagnosed as suffering from mental illness. Lobotomies at the time were commonly used to treat those with mental health issues, but were rarely used to treat intellectual disabilities. It was soon discovered, however, that Rosemary's condition had not improved after the lobotomy. Instead, it had diminished. Her mental capacity resembled that of a two-year-old, and she could not walk or speak intelligibly, and was incontinent. Following the botched surgery, she was immediately institutionalized, eventually winding up in Jefferson, Wisconsin, where she lived from 1949 until her death. Her father had learned of the St. Coletta School for Exceptional Children and promptly had a private house built on the grounds near Alverno House, designed for adults requiring lifelong care. The nuns dubbed Rosemary's home the Kennedy Cottage. She was provided with a car that could be used to take her on drives and a dog that she was able to take on walks. She did eventually learn to walk again, but always did so with a limp. Following the lobotomy and her subsequent move 
into lifelong full-time care, the Kennedys distanced themselves from Rosemary. Her mother didn't visit her for 20 years, while her father never visited her at all. Reportedly, her siblings were unaware of her whereabouts and didn't know of the lobotomy for two decades. The family explained her absence by saying Rosemary was reclusive, eventually revealing in 1961 that she had been institutionalized. It was not until 1987, however, that her lobotomy was made public. Following their father's death in 1969, Rosemary's siblings began to get involved in her life. She was occasionally taken to visit relatives, and every summer she would return to Hyannisport with her family, where they spent their summers as children. They would frequently throw birthday parties for Rosemary, singing happy birthday and providing her with cake, something she reportedly loved. Her carers recalled that she had a sweet tooth and enjoyed having visitors. Her brother Ted would often play the piano and sing for her, and she was eventually able to go swimming again, which she enjoyed. Rosemary never regained the ability to speak clearly, and her upper arm remained partially paralyzed. She died from natural causes in 2005 at the age of 86. Four of her siblings, Jean, Eunice, Patricia, and Ted, were by her side at the time. She was buried beside her parents in Hollywood Cemetery in Brookline, Massachusetts. The Flatwoods Monster In Flatwoods, West Virginia, on the evening of September 12, 1952, two brothers named Edward and Fred May, ages 13 and 12 respectively, along with their friend, 10-year-old Tommy Heyer, were playing outside when they claimed to have seen a bright object move across the sky before landing on the property of a local farmer. Curious and excited about what they'd witnessed, the boys ran to Edward and Fred's mother, Kathleen, where they explained the sighting. The foursome, along with two more boys, a teenager and a dog, went to the farm to try and locate whatever they'd seen in the sky. At the top of the hill, they saw a pulsing red light. 17-year-old Eugene Lemon recalled aiming his flashlight in that direction, where he momentarily caught a glimpse of a tall, man-like figure with a round, red face surrounded by a pointed, hood-like shape. The figure possibly had claws for hands, but it was difficult to tell in the thick veil of mist. The group also recalled smelling a pungent mist, with some later reporting that they experienced nausea. News reports state that Eugene screamed and fell backwards when the creature made a hissing sound and reportedly glided toward the group. The dog subsequently ran from the scene with its tail between its legs, and the rest of the group, including Eugene, also decided to make a swift exit. There were reports that an aircraft had crashed in the area, and during the search, the local sheriff and deputy explored the farm where the incident with the round-faced creature had taken place, but they found nothing. There were no odd scents, sounds, or sights to behold. Local newspaper publisher A. Lee Stewart stated that he'd gone up the hill himself, armed with his shotgun. He described the group of seven as the most scared people I've ever seen, adding that he believed their account because people don't make up that kind of story that quickly. Stewart also stated that he'd found skid marks in the field and an odd, gummy deposit. UFO enthusiasts took this as evidence that an alien spaceship had landed. The tale of what would soon be called the Flatwoods Monster was so astonishing that even the local newspapers began reporting on it. Before long, the story was featured on national radio broadcasts and newspapers all across the country. Kathleen May and Eugene Lemon reportedly even went to New York to talk with CBS. Notably, this was not the first sighting of such a creature. A woman by the name of Audra Harper reportedly saw a similar looking figure months before the September sighting in her town of Heaters, about five miles north of Flatwoods. She and her friends took a shortcut through a forest path and saw what they described as a ball of fire on a nearby hill. They initially thought nothing of it until they glanced back and saw the fire was gone, and in its place stood a tall, dark, human-shaped silhouette. Audra and her friends promptly ran from the forest. A further bizarre incident occurred on September 13th in Flatwoods, when a couple, along with their 18-month-old baby, were driving between Clay and Braxton County on Route 4, when their car abruptly died and failed to start up again. It was dark and the road was empty, and just moments later, 
An unpleasant smell filled the air. The couple's baby began to cry. Following this, a bright light filled the darkness, and the pair saw a tall, dark creature hovering before their vehicle. The couple described this figure differently. Though it was ten foot tall, like the Flatwoods monster, its head was reportedly reptilian. It dragged a lizard-like hand over the vehicle's hood before drifting away from them and vanishing into the woods. As soon as it was gone, the car began functioning again and the couple hurriedly drove off. They later recounted the tale for a magazine in 1955. Not everyone believed the story of the Flatwoods monster, however. State police laughed off the reports as hysteria, and the US Air Force had their doubts too. They concluded that a bright but common meteor had soared through the sky at dusk that evening, and suggested that the claw-handed creature was probably just an owl, distorted by shadows, lighting and the group's anxiety. Joe Nickel of the Committee for Skeptical Inquiry agreed with this notion after investigating the case himself in 2000, adding that the pulsing light was possibly an aircraft navigation or hazard beacon. It has even been suggested that the group experienced nausea as it is a symptom consistent with hysteria and overexertion. In the years since the Flatwoods monster was first seen, it has become a popular local legend and tourist attraction. Hundreds of visitors stop by the town every summer to eat the Flatwoods Monster Burger and examine old newspaper clippings and photos from the time. Tourists can even see a chunk of the old oak tree from behind which the creature appeared. The Flatwoods Monster has taken its place, alongside the Mothman and Batboy, as one of West Virginia's most bizarre and persistent unexplained mysteries. The Man Who Sold His Soul to the Devil, John Fian. Dr. John Fian was a Scottish schoolmaster in Preston Pans, East Lothian, who lived during the 16th century, described as argumentative, ill-tempered, and somebody who indulged in vulgar sexual behavior. Fian had been long engaged in a dispute with a local magistrate named David Seaton. Seaton and his son were known witch hunters and were convinced that a string of bad luck, which involved them getting into financial difficulties, was down to someone committing ungodly acts against them. In November of 1590, in an attempt to discover who had put a curse on him, Seaton questioned a young maidservant who he believed was involved in witchcraft. Following a bout of horrific torture, the maidservant confessed to being a witch, and went on to name several others. This subsequently triggered what was later known as the North Berwick Witch Trials, the first major Scottish witch hunt. After the maidservant's confession, Dr. Fian was taken into custody and tortured. He had been named as the head of the coven of North Berwick Witches, and during his time in custody he confessed, claiming that he was working for Satan himself. This did not alleviate the torture, however, as Fian was forced to undergo more and more violent acts, including having his head bound in a rope and twisted, and having his feet crushed. Reportedly, at some point during this round of torture, he indicated that he wanted to divulge more information, but seemed unable to speak. His abusers checked beneath his tongue and discovered two charmed pins, which, once removed, allowed Fian to share more details. Fian confessed that he had bewitched a man who was interested in an unmarried woman he was pursuing, and that he'd cursed him in such a way that the man would enter an hour-long state of insanity every day. To prove this, the man was brought before King James, as was Fian, and in an instant, Fian had thrown him into this state of madness. The man was witnessed screaming, convulsing, and jumping high enough to touch the ceiling. Once an hour had passed, he told the king that he had no recollection of what had happened during that time. Another story said that Fian was so besotted with the previously mentioned woman that he sought to force her into falling in love with him. But for the enchantment, he would need several of her hairs. He coerced a pupil of his, who was the woman's brother, into getting the hairs for him, on the promise that he would no longer beat him during lessons, but he disturbed his sister in her sleep, and she notified their mother of his behaviour. The pair's mother was a practising witch herself, and gave the brother hairs to take to Fian. He accepted them and cast a spell. It turned out that the hairs belonged to a cow, who turned up at Fian's door and began following him everywhere he went. This caused much hilarity among local villagers. 
Fian claimed that his first visit from the devil was when he was lying in bed at night. He had been living with a man who had promised to clean the residence, but had failed to do so. Fian was frustrated by this, and the devil sought to take advantage of his anger by trying to convince him to burn down the house, which he declined to do. The devil told him that he would want for nothing and would gain the power to avenge his enemies if he became his servant. Following his confession to King James, Fian was returned to his cell, where he subsequently recanted his pact with the devil and swore to live an honest Christian life. He claimed that he'd renounced Satan to his face. The following night, Fian stole a cell key from a guard and fled the jail, but was soon apprehended and tortured yet again. Despite the brutality he suffered, Fian this time refused to confess, claiming he'd only done so earlier in the hopes of saving his life. Despite his attempts at retracting his confession, several charges were brought against Fian. He was ultimately found guilty of witchcraft and taken to Edinburgh, where he was strangled with a rope before his body was burned in a large fire on January 27, 1591. Before death, Fian once more declared his innocence. Jojo, Stavanger, Norway. Stavanger is the third largest city in Norway and is steeped in cultural heritage that dates back to 1125. It is a stunning place to visit and our patron Jojo is lucky enough to live there. For you Jojo, we will first look at Ustein Abbey. Ustein Abbey, located in Stavanger, Norway, was established in 1180 by a Benedictine monk. It served as a monastery throughout the 12th century and over the subsequent centuries, it was destroyed a number of times, including in 1308, when it was damaged during a fire. However, it was rebuilt each time. In the 16th century, the abbey was disbanded, but in 1619, it was purchased by local residents and turned into a manor house, receiving significant restoration in the 19th and 20th centuries. Today, it is the oldest building in Stavanger and serves as an interesting historical tourist spot, Unsurprisingly, given its age and background, it is considered to be haunted by dark forces. It is said that the screams of the monks who died in the 1308 fire can still be heard, echoing into the night, and for decades, legend claimed that whoever entered the abbey in search of paranormal activity would not return the same person. Instead, thrill-seekers who decided to venture inside would re-emerge traumatized and hysterical, while others who were less fortunate wouldn't come back at all. Instead, their bodies, horrifically mutilated and disfigured, would be found days later, having been dragged outside by whatever lurks within its walls. Further stories claim that beasts with yellow eyes call the abbey home, always on the prowl for new victims to feed on. The most notable story from Ulstein Abbey, however, is that of the German family. Christopher Garman lived in or near the building during the 18th century in the company of his wife Cecilia. However, shortly afterwards, in 1759, Cecilia died in the abbey during childbirth. She was just 25 years old. On her deathbed, Christopher promised that he would never marry again, and although he kept that promise for 20 years, he eventually met a woman, 36 years his junior, whom he wanted to settle down with. However, he seemed to feel an element of guilt or unease about the situation, as if a part of him believed his deceased wife would know of his broken promise so he arranged for the wedding to his new bride to take place in Stavanger Cathedral. However, Cecilia, intensely enraged and heartbroken by his decision to break the promise he made, found Christopher and confronted him as a spirit. She appeared right in front of him during the ceremony, and he promptly fell into a coma. Eight days later, Christopher died. Though he was gone, Cecilia remained. She is said to still wander around the abbey, wearing her wedding dress, and has a particular dislike of men who come to visit the Abbey. Have you ever been to the Abbey, Jojo? Now I'm sure we're pronouncing these names wrong, but lastly we'll look at the old town of Stavanger. This ancient coastal town with its narrow twisted streets and centuries old buildings has an eerie feel and is regarded as one of the most haunted towns in Norway. Legend states it is haunted by the spirits of those who once lived and died there. On misty nights, people have reported seeing strange figures lurking in the shadows of the ancient buildings. Some have heard disembodied voices speaking to them, but when they look around, no one can be seen. Others have witnessed full-bodied pale apparitions that disappear when you get too close. Even in the daytime, 
visitors have reported a feeling of being constantly watched and speak of a lingering, malevolent presence. No one knows for sure who these restless spirits are, but it seems that there is a sinister energy hanging over the town. We'd love to know if you have visited Jojo and whether you experienced anything unsettling. Thank you so much for supporting on Patreon. And remember everyone, if you want us to find out what lurks on your doorstep, head on over to Patreon for more information and become a member of our Too Close to Home Club. We have some very exciting things coming this year. Thanks for watching, and as always, we'll see you in the next video.